And now, the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 24th chapter. Jesus said to his disciples, But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May be I always tend to get a little too excited about these things, so instead of last week, I guess today I should say Happy New Year, because today is the new, you know, the, new, the new Year day of the new church year, the first week of Advent. Our wreath has made its appearance and begun to be lit. The blue pyramids that, that uh, represent our longing and hopefulness be, again decorate the worship space. If you haven't noticed, the greens are starting to be hung. There's a different feeling in the air these days. I mean, the word Advent itself comes from an old Latin word that means coming. These are the weeks that we wait for the coming of Jesus, both in his first arrival as a baby born in the manger and as we think about and look forward to his second coming to redeem the world. We're getting ready. We're looking for what is to come. We're preparing. My fear is, though, that as we do all of these things, we're not living. We hear these dire warnings from Jesus in our gospel reading today, which is part of this very long lecture that Jesus is giving his disciples and giving us about being too concerned with what is to come. Yes, preparations are necessary so that we will be ready for what is to come, but can we just stop at that point? Don't worry about more than that. Don't worry about when it is that you need to be prepared for. Just being prepared is enough. I wonder if the disciples that Jesus were, was talking to were as concerned with time as we are today. And that's why he had to address this issue. For many, when they hear this teaching from Jesus, this reading in the gospel, the first thing that came to mind for them was that old R.E.M. song. It's the end of the world as we know it. I feel fine. Yeah, I'll be stuck in your head. <laughs> but instead, what came to mind for me was this other song by Hootie and the Blowfish, Time. I won't sing it, but it goes, one of the verses says, Time, the past has come and gone. The future's far away. Now only lasts for one second. One second. We, as a culture, have become obsessed with time. Everywhere we look, there's a clock. We wear one on our wrist. There's one on the dashboard of our cars. Our cell phones and computers always have the current time on them. Many rooms in our house have clocks. We've even hung clocks in our worship space so the preachers know not to go too long. Much like a lot of our technology, our clocks have even gotten smarter than us. Many of them update themselves when it comes to daylight savings time, or they quickly show the correct time as soon as you plug them into the wall. We even have atomic clocks that will, sh will sh tell us to the second exactly what time it is, so we always know. Because we need to know what time it is. What time are we waking up? What time is our bedtime? Can we have just five more minutes for each? What time does school or work start? What time is lunch? What time do we get to go home? 
We watch as those minutes click by, as we wait for all those times to come. We set deadlines and timetables, due dates and meeting times. Appointments must be kept to the minute or else you're late for the next one. We've got, in line, we've got to be in line for that Black Friday deal as early as we can because they only last for a certain amount of hours. Much of what we do is controlled by time. And we've, been, we've become consumers of time. We're always wanting more, that we never have enough. We'll even sometimes bargain or make deals so that we get additional time. It's become a driving force in our culture. Turn on any news program and you'll almost always see a countdown clock for the next big news story. And this month especially, we're faced with how many more days there are until Christmas. Or as Stephen Colbert would say, we only have 24, 25 more shopping days until the birth of our Savior. I get it. I do it too. I, I wear the watch. I know why we have to keep the time, I think. But my fear in all this is that we go from the past to the future with very little time spent in the present. Our time-obsessed culture keeps looking at our watches so that we can be ready and prepared for what is to come next. We keep our calendars and our, our planners close at hand so that we have a good grasp of what we need to do in the coming days and weeks. And then we spend part of our time enjoying and remembering or sometimes regretting the past and what we've done and haven't done. So tell me this, where does the present stand in all of that? What does the gap between the past and the future look like? Do we count the present as the current minute in which we're living? Or have our clocks and watches driven us to live in, in and by the second? If we define the word present as something that exists or occurs now, then how would we define now? What is now? Is it a generation? Is it a, a lifetime? A season, a month, a minute, a millisecond? I'm sure everyone here, your answer is going to vary to that and probably even depends on the day we're having. But I guess my obsession with all this thinking about time in the present comes from a lot of recent conversations I've had about the fragility of our lives. So much can change in just the blink of an eye. A simple fall or a slip on the ice, a car accident, a diagnosis or a surgery, an explosion or a natural disaster. In those instances, the, the present may just be a millisecond, but those results that come from it are forever. And none of us know when that millisecond for each one of us will be. Could be this afternoon or tomorrow or a year, or 20, or 80 down the road. This is why Jesus is telling us that we shouldn't worry about this time of ti type of timing. All we can do is be prepared. Well, prepared for what? Prepared for the end. Prepared with hope and faith in an eternal life that's free from suffering and death. Prepared for a life full of grace, with salvation that only comes from Jesus, our Emmanuel, our God with us. Prepared by living a life in the love and grace of Jesus' first appearing. That is what Jesus is talking about as we live in whatever present we define ourselves to be living in and as we look to the future of his coming again. Again, we don't know when that will be and we don't need to know. Only the Father knows, and they say, that's okay. We're simply called to live in the present, between the past birth of our Savior and his future return. Don't keep staring at your watches and calendars, says Jesus. Live in the present. Live now. Live like the folks in Noah's day, how they were living. Jesus said, you know, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, a.k.a. They were living life. They weren't focusing on the past or worrying about the future. 
They were creating a present now for themselves. They were doing what it took to sustain, maintain, and grow life. Well, that is, until the flood came and swept them all away. Now, when he says that, does that mean that those who were living in the present were washed away, never to be seen again? Well, maybe not. Maybe they were swept away on the ark, being given that second chance in new life. He's saying living in the present doesn't necessarily doom you to death. Jesus goes on to give two more examples. Two people will be in a field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two will be grinding meal, one will be taken, one will be left. Are those ones who are taken just snatched up by God and the others left for dead? Maybe not. I think Jesus, again, is primarily telling us to be ready at any moment. Be ready in the present now for that unexpected hour. Well, again, how do we be ready? How do we prepare ourselves while living in the present? Well, as Darren read, Paul tells us in in his letter to the Romans that we are to put on the armor of light. We are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In all that we do in this present moment, we are to be the light of Christ. Light that breaks through the darkness of sin and evil in our world. We are to show and exude the love of God in in every thought, word, and deed that comes from our being. Our life now takes all that happened, all that has happened in the past and anticipates and shows everyone around us just what a hopeful future will look like. That, I believe, is what it means to be prepared and be on guard. That's what helps us get through those present times when we face trouble and death. So as we live in today's moment, in the midst of a season of preparation and waiting, I invite us to be in that present moment. Even in the midst of Christmas music and decorations, in the midst of the dire warnings of less and less time to shop for our friends and loved ones, and in the midst of the anxiety of all of our impending to-do lists, may, may we take a chance to turn away from our calendars and clocks and just remember what Jesus has done for us. May we remember the joy and the hope that has come into our world to save us from the troubles of the world. While our immediate futures may remain uncertain, and do remain uncertain. Our eternal futures are guaranteed to be ones filled with mercy and love. I say thanks be to God. Amen.